Before most of us even knew what COVID-19 was, nurses in the province were already seeing the face of it in some of the very first patients. A year on, nurses continue to be the frontline caregivers in this pandemic, and too often the last human contact for those who've succumbed to this terrible virus. How do they do it? Well, with us to try to understand some of what nurses in the province have been facing, we welcome in Kenora, Ontario, Janet Paulson, registered nurse in the infection prevention and control team at Lake of the Woods District Hospital. In Trenton, Ontario, Patricia Monroe, professor and coordinator of the practical nursing program at Loyalist College and a registered nurse at Correctional Services Canada. In Hamilton, Ontario, Amy Varley, registered nurse in the Niagara region and the co-founder and co-host of the Gritty Nurse podcast. And here in the provincial capital, Vicki Boteng, a registered nurse in the Critical Care Trauma Unit at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre. And we are happy to welcome you four on this International Women's Day to TVO tonight for a very important and timely conversation about what it has been like to be a nurse in this province for the past year. And Janet, I'm going to start with you first. Uh, you're a long way away from us. In fact, you're in a different time zone. We should remind everybody about that. You're an hour behind us in northwestern Ontario. Your hospital has recently seen a surge in COVID-19 cases over the past few days. So I wonder if you could tell us, give us a sense about what the unique challenges are, given where you are and given what you're dealing with. For sure. We um, have had more cases over the last month or so. Um, really only having a trickling of cases um, since COVID began. Uh, we've had a, a surge in one of our First Nations communities in our community and um, more recently over the weekend, kind of unexpected, we've had an outbreak at our hospital. Uh, we've been able to um, determine that it's confined to one inpatient unit. Um, uh, there's a total of nine patients that uh, have been here for a period of time and uh, developed COVID since they um, have been hospitalized. So that's what uh, an outbreak is defined as. Mm -hmm. And um, we're still investigating the source of the cause. We have our index cases, but there is lots of work to do. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, Janet, because because surely you guys are all taking the you know, the appropriate precautions that need to be taken. So what are the theories about how this outbreak took place? Um, well, we'll, we'll look, investigate everything, uh, see if it was a visitor that brought it in, see if it was a patient that went undetected, um, or see if it was a staff member uh, that was unwell. Um, we've been fortunate enough, we have had no uh, healthcare worker acquired uh, COVID since uh, the uh, pandemic began. Uh, so um, we're hoping that we can uh, stay strong with that. Right. And how many hospital beds and or ICU beds have you got there? Uh, we have 56 medical surgical beds, uh, 14 mental health beds, and four ICU beds. Four ICU uh, beds. Are they? Uh, what, what's the status of them right now? Um, actually, I haven't uh, seen the census this morning, so I'm not sure. Uh, I think there is two to three patients in there. Uh, that's what was what, what yesterday. So um, uh, lots of investigating to do still. Yeah, okay, thanks for that, Janet. Uh, Patricia, uh, let me just um, point out for the record that um, we've had many pets make cameo appearances on this program and yours apparently just did as well. So welcome to the gathering. That's all, all par for the course around here. Uh, I wanna ask you about um, the Reopening Ontario Act. Much of this province is going to reopen now in a way that it has not over the past month, and I'm wondering how that's going to have an impact on nurses. Well, I think that uh, most nurses right now, we have such a nursing shortage uh, at the hospitals, and certainly we're graduating a lot of students at Loyalist, and the they're working two to three jobs, and it's getting very busy, and I do worry about uh, COVID fatigue with people not getting time off to recuperate and to um, rejuvenate who they are. What kind of time off are they getting in the midst of all this? Again, I can't speak exactly for everybody, but I can say that most of my graduates are working at least two to three jobs, and um, which is nice when you're a brand new grad, so you can pay off your loan. But over time, that can uh, lead to burnout. And I, probably everybody here on the panel will tell you that they are working um, at full tilt, 100% capacity as well. Are you hearing that from your former graduates, that they are, even at their young age, 
feeling burned out already? Some of them are. Yeah, some of them are. And uh, I do worry about them leaving the profession because it's, um, like I said, there we have such a nursing shortage. I don't know if people realize that. And there, um, you could, I, I would like to see more funding for nurses to come along. I mean, even right now, we're running a vaccine clinic at our college and we're using um, some of our, our students in that vaccine clinic. So there is a, a real need for nurses in this community. Hmm. Vicki, you're an ICU nurse on the front lines. What are you seeing from other nurses? Uh, yeah, I would have to agree. Um, we're, we're beyond burnt out at this time. There's a lot of fatigue that's going around. Um, and I think a lot of people are feeling a little bit hopeless about what their nursing career looks like ahead of them at this point. Um, I've been in nursing for 10 years at this point, and I never thought I would ever experience or have to work through a pandemic. So it has totally rocked a lot of us. I think emotionally we're all drained um, and we're a little concerned about how we're gonna sort of pick ourselves up and keep going. Um, it's, it's a big concern for a lot of us right now. Vicki, have you thought about leaving the job? To be honest, yeah, from time to time. Um, but it keeps pulling me back because I love my nursing community. I love what I do. Um, I've worked in the trauma ICU for almost eight and a half years, and it's something that I can say that it's been a calling for mine. Um, it's something that there are days that you have those bright moments and you're able to help out a patient and everything connects and everything works out. And then COVID happens and you're not really sure what to do anymore, right? So um, it's definitely been on my mind, but nursing will always be my my passion, no matter what. And I, I, well, listen, you tell me, but I'm going to guess that at various times over the past year, you have been the last human being that somebody's loved one has seen as they have died from COVID-19. Has that happened? Yeah, that's happened. Um, ooh, uh, it's a very emotional, visceral experience to be in. Um, not to say like we've had patients pass away in the ICU before pre COVID and at least you were able to let families come in early and spend some last moments with them and actually detach from the situation. So you weren't a link in this person's memory of like seeing their last love, seeing their loved one for the last time. Now with COVID, you are, you are just linked into this whole entire memory and you want to give privacy and respect to the patient that is passing and to their family, but you're not able to all the time, right? So um, sometimes you have to replace that family member and be the sea filler until somebody can come and see them. And it's a burden and an emotional toll that I don't think any of us knew that we were signing up for at the beginning of this pandemic. Hmm. Amy, how have you managed the past year? Oh my goodness. You know, honestly, one of the things that I would speak to is I'm, I'm, I feel that I'm fortunate that I actually have my own little outlet, which is our podcast. And through talking to other people and bringing other people's experience to the forefront, I feel that's one of the ways that I've been able to cope because it's, it's been tough. And also with being work with, um, kind of working and overseeing kind of the emergency departments, this is the door, the window where everyone comes in and it's, it's tough knowing that, you know, my fellow colleagues are under this amount of stress and sometimes even feeling like I can't even help them or I can't support them the way that I'd like to. So it's been, it's been, it's been been it's been really challenging. I asked Patricia about one act of the Ontario legislature and I'd like to ask you about another one because this definitely affects you and that is Bill 163. It's called the Supporting Ontario's First Responders Act and the whole idea behind it is to give additional support to our, as the name of the bill suggests, our first responders to mitigate right. the potential effects of uh, post-traumatic stress that they no doubt deal with during the course of their jobs. I guess I want to know, first of all, are nurses at the moment part of that list of protected groups? So at the moment, nurses are not, which is actually quite surprising, knowing the amount of stress and burnout that we actually do, uh, do, do uh, see. There's actually been a lot of evidence that supports how much stress and anxiety nurses have actually been dealing with. And um, there's actually been a report that was re released by the Canadian Federation of Nurses uh, Union that talks about the mental disorder and symptoms among nurses in Canada based on a lot of research that they had done. And there's an alarming rate of mental health disorder among 
thousands of nurses. They said up to one third had screened positive for major depressive disorders, um, lots of issues with anxiety disorder. And really, um, the, the, the big ticket is PTSD, knowing that we also face that as well. And if we are the same as our police colleagues, firefighter colleagues, paramedics that see these t traumatic events, it, it, it begs the question as to why we are actually not a part of Bill 163. Well, we, uh, I mean, you just made the list. Police, fire, ambulance, those are the ones we traditionally think of as first responders. Do you think this COVID crisis has forced on us um, an opportunity to rethink what it means to be a first responder? Absolutely. I mean, we should have been thinking about this before COVID because this is something that we intricately deal with. We deal with death. We deal with trauma. This actually isn't really new. It's it's really surprising to me, and it, it makes me really wonder, like, why not nurses? Um, and I, and I kind of always bring it back to the fact that is it because we're a woman dominated profession, is there thoughts and concerns that we should be handling this differently than our police or firefighter colleagues, that we should be stronger or whatever the case may be. And I think that's an, an unfair assumption. We do the work, we see the, the, the atrocities, the trauma, we should be included in a bill such as this. Well, I mean, I've known Doris Greenspun for a long time. She's the head of the mm -hmm. Registered Nurses Association of Ontario. And I know she's fighting like hell with this government to get you included. Uh, yeah. What do you think the chances are that you will be? You know, I, I have no idea. And this is why I continue to ask people to raise their voices and to speak out about what's happening in nursing. We can't stay silent anymore. We have to continue having these these conversations because we are the only people that are going to suffer. If we don't actually say what's happening and we don't stand up, then nothing will change. And I mean, we we have to have greater awareness, acknowledgement that these things are happening, education, and then move forward with action. I know that the bill was, the last I've heard of it was um, 2018, and then there was a, a change in power. So essentially it was under the li liberal government, and now it's under the um, conservative government, but we need to move this forward. Okay, let's go back to Janet in northwestern Ontario. You know, Janet, uh, obviously a lot of people have been able to or have been forced to work from home during the course of this pandemic, and, and many can and have. Now, obviously that's not an option if you're a nurse. you got to be, <laughs> you can't do your job from home, obviously. How are you and your colleagues balancing all of your professional obligations to continue to go to a workplace while at the same time, I presume deal with kids, deal with aging parents, deal with everything you've got, also got to deal with on that so-called second shift. Yeah, everybody's got something else outside of work. You know, I have two small children that are school-aged um, and can't stay home by themselves. They're in grade uh, two and grade and kindergarten. So uh, I needed somebody uh, to watch my children uh, when Ontario shut down. Um, and uh, I was very fortunate. I had a cousin that was, um, finishing up her first year university and she um, jumped to the opportunity to help and took my kids in a second because my husband's also an essential worker. So it was very difficult. I was able to this past weekend work from home, uh, but there are certain things that I can't do from home. Obviously, nurses that provide direct patient care can't work from home. Uh, so we're constantly juggling either um, trying to find adequate staffing to make sure that uh, patients are cared for um, while nurses are uh, trying to balance their life at home. So it's been very challenging. And with a shortage of nurses, like I could say all of our specialty areas in our hospital, um, you know, if if we have somebody off an extended period of time, we're struggling. So it's it's been quite a challenge. Patricia, how have you and your colleagues managed that balance? Um, most of my colleagues have actually picked up a little bit more work to help out because um, where I work, I'm teaching. And so most of us have gone back out into the field to help. And so we are working quite a bit where we would normally have a weekend off. We're out there working. So the balance is challenging. I don't think any of us thought it would last this long. I actually really thought it would, might be maybe three to six months, and I think we're coming up to a year now. 
Can I just be clear on what you're doing right now? I mean, you are the professor and the coordinator of the practical nursing program at Loyalist. Okay, we get that. Mm -hmm. are, 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 you, are, are you nursing as well? Yes, yes, I am. So Where? since uh, COVID started, I have been, there was a registry that went out and it asked all nurses uh, if they would put their name into a registry to help out with COVID. And I think most people know about, well, maybe they don't know about that. It was retired nurses and nurses that are working. And so we've all tried to go out to help. Um, and so right now I am working with Corrections Canada as uh, um, on the front line. You're going into jails? Correct. You are a glutton for punishment, I gotta say. What? Uh, how's that well, going? Well, no different than well, no different than any other nurse in Ontario. Every nurse I know is helping out. I think nursing is a calling, and when you feel um, when you're dealing in empathy all the time, you want to help out your fellow workers. So it's going okay. I will admit that um, I am getting a bit tired, um, but I feel for those that are working front lines full time. So for me, I'm teaching basically from home and try, we're trying to get our nursing students out into the field. Um, so it, it, yeah, it's challenging, but it's uh, also very rewarding. Okay, but uh, let's be clear, prisons are congregate care settings. That is a place where COVID-19 right. flourishes. Uh, I, I sure wanna know that you're getting adequate PPE, personal protective equipment, and that you're as safe as you possibly can be given the dangers of the circumstances in which you're working. Is that the case? I do feel very safe. I will say that in the beginning, uh, the last time we spoke, I, you know, the PPE, there was quite a bit of shortage. We were worried about that. But I feel that with Corrections Canada, I am very safe. I am getting adequate PPE. Um, and I think that we're handling it quite well, actually. Okay. Amy, let me bring you back in on the issue of, obviously, you know, nurses can get sick like anybody else can get sick. When that happens, what happens? Well, this is, this is such a huge, important conversation. And really what should happen is if nurses are sick, they should stay home. I mean, that's the rationale that like if you're sick, that you should not come into work. But not all nurses actually get paid sick days. Um, and, and that's hugely concerning. And it's, and it's not even just nurses. But we also, when I talk about my advocacy work, we also talk about PSWs as well. Um, we really understand at this time that like if a nurse, let's say they only work part time and they're or casual and they're calling sick, they're actually not going to get paid for that time. And that's hugely concerning. Or if they they are afraid of calling in sick, they actually go to work sick, which is the other thing that we don't want in terms of infection control. And we just need to have better policies around sick days. I mean, right now, one of the things that we do have is the CERB, but that's actually not really beneficial. It'll cover a small portion, but not nearly as much as, you know, if a nurse was to have that full wholesome pay. We shouldn't have to be worried about whether we go in, whether we um, can put food on our table, whether we can pay our bills or go into work sick. Like, I, th I think that's a choice that we shouldn't have to be forced to be to make at this time. And I think that the government needs to do more. I know there's been lots of work. Um, and right now, it, it's it's really frustrating for nurses to hear it being bounced back and forth provincially, federally, provincially, federally. federally. We just need to have a, a clear stance that nurses need paid sick days. That's just it. And can I confirm this with you? You do know nurses, are you telling us, who have gone to work sick because they were afraid of either losing their position or their or or the money that comes along with their work. Yeah, this is this is an unfortunate situation and I think maybe all, also the colleagues on here can actually speak to the culture of nursing too. It's just there's so many things that come along with even going into work sick. It's you don't want to let your team down, you know, if you call in sick that you're going to leave your your crew and your 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 uh colleagues short there's a lot of other things that come with it so it's not just you know that selfish nature of you know we want to bring disease or illness into the organization we understand that there are those other challenges and that there's that culture that like if you're not dying that you should come into work sick um that's sorry that you should go into work whether you're sick or not and i think that is something that we need to continue to talk about and again if you give nurses the support that they need then maybe we wouldn't be going into work um with an illness as well. Hmm. Vicki, can I get you to weigh in on that as well? Yeah, I would have to agree with what she said. Um, there's so much guilt when you're calling in sick because then you're thinking, like, like as she said earlier, 
my my work family, my crew is going to be working short. What if they get a ton of admissions? Like, you all know what it feels like to work when you are short staffed. So when you think, oh, I might be feeling sick, you feel like you can push through because you just don't want your team to be working under that much more stress where they're already under so much stress throughout the day. So um, unfortunately, it is it is a decision a lot of nurses make because you just don't want your, you don't want to let anyone down. Well, let me just confirm this, Vicki, because obviously in a lot of workplaces, if somebody has to book off sick, uh, you know, management figures out how to get somebody in there to take their place and the rest of the team is not adversely affected. Does that not happen in, in the hospital setting? They try it their best to get as many people to come in and work overtime, but sometimes you just don't have the staff. Um, I believe it was Trisha was saying that like nursing has been working short staff for many years. This is not something that's new. On top of having COVID, now it's just coming to the light of how short units and hospitals have been working in the past couple of years. Hmm. Have you ever gone to work sick? Unfortunately, yes. Um, and you're just trying to like have as much hot tea and like take as much cold medicine as possible. But I mean, it's not something that we're all proud of. We've all had to do it a couple of times, but I mean, you know better, but at the same time, you don't want your, your colleagues to be working short. I hear you, but, but surely your colleagues know you well enough to know that if you had to take a sick day, you're not shirking. It's because you, you genuinely can't do your job. Uh, is that not, I mean, is that understanding not not a part of your reality? I think we all understand that, but we all want to be there for one another and to help the team out. Very admirable. All right, Amy, let me go back to you because you recently co-wrote a piece in the Globe and Mail and we want to read a little excerpt of it, share it with our viewers and listeners right now. Here it goes. Now that the vaccine is here, nurses are still fighting to be heard. For instance, when the Ontario Provincial Vaccine Distribution Task Force was created, nurses hoped that maybe we'd get a seat at the table. We administer the majority of vaccines, so why not listen to our input for how it would be rolled out? But it came as no surprise that when the list of names was announced, there was no nursing representation. Our voices have been left out, noticeably silenced and absent from the decision-making process. Okay, Amy, a couple of things I want to follow up here. Number one, if you were at the table, what would you be telling them? Oh my goodness, that's such an excellent question. I mean, I think the first thing that I'd be telling them is like, we have so much experience and so much knowledge in terms of, you know, rolling out plans, rolling out um, change management, that we'd be able to help support with some of these things. And right now we're seeing that that disparity between getting the vaccine into people's arms while we actually have it available to us. So I think that's the other piece. I think people think that nurses we only do the bedside work. We are change agents. We are really good at problem solving. Like I think you can give a nurse any problem and we're really going to be quick to work through it. And I think that having our lens would have been hugely beneficial, but nobody asked us to actually provide that support, which is, which is insane. Did somebody from the nurses association make a stink about the fact that you weren't at the table? Um, I don't know if I would say that they made a stink. I think maybe I probably made more of a stink than anybody else <laughs> in terms of trying to get our vo our voices heard, right? I think, I I mean, there's only so much that I could do. So I tweet about it. I would reach out to my colleagues and t continue to get them to raise their voices. And finally, we actually were heard. But I, I think there's still so much work that needs to be done in terms of having us make these decisions and or allowing us to have a seat at the table. And I think that there's no better time to do it than now. Amy, I think actually you did hang out with some fairly heavy hitters at one point during the course of this, because did you not moderate a discussion or co-moderate a discussion with Prime Minister Trudeau and Health Minister Patty Haidu? And if you did, well, I know you did, so I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll save the spoiler alert here. But having said that, did you bring it up during that conversation? Absolutely. I mean, one, one of the things I say is if you give me the mic, I'm going to run with it. So I had the opportunity in my introduction to say, hey, you know, we have been noticeably silent. We have been noticeably absent from the decision making tables and we need to talk about it because you know what? We are just as part just as important part of the care team as physicians, housekeepers, we need to have our voices heard too. And it was just surprising that, you know, no one asked us or no one thought to think that, you know, it's important to hear from the perspective of nurses, knowing how intricately we are involved. Like we spend the 11.25 hours a day with our patients 
why not ask us about some of the concerns that might happen? Um, I, I believe we're best poised to have these conversations. We always hear physicians, but it's now time to actually hear from nurses as well. This feels very uncontroversial in 2021. Why do you think it still doesn't happen? You know what? I think there's so many there's so many barriers, right? I mean, I think I can speak to just even being a woman, a woman of color, um, and it's it's historical, right? I think it's also that you know we, there's a lot of change that needs to occur, a lot of courageous and difficult conversations, and one of them is talking about advocacy work and having the seat of the table as you know a racialized as a racialized female. And I think that there's no better time to do it than now. And I'm going to continue using my voice to speak up for change in terms of mental health, nursing, as well as women's health and women's rights. I, you know, I do wonder because, uh, and you know, I don't want to overdo this here, but like the, the minister in charge of procuring our vaccines is a racialized woman. And, and you know, clearly the, the prime minister of the country has enough faith in her to give her one of the most important jobs in government today. So uh, can I get you re to revisit that? I wouldn't say that's the only piece of the puzzle. I do think that it is it is a different, it is a part of it. Because I guess if you look at women and not even just women in politics, but women in power, we make up a very small percent of it. And then if you add racialized women to that, it's an even smaller number. So I, I mean, it does factor into it. And I think it's, again, like a conversation we need to continue to have. Like, why do we not see more people at these tables? I do a lot of work at Niagara as well in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and representation matters. We need to have other voices to bring different perspectives to see, to, to talk about change. Okay, fair enough. Uh, can I ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, here for a four shot? Can we see all four guests? Well, thank you, Sheldon. I would like to see a show of hands right now, recognizing the fact that you are four frontline people who are going to some of the most dangerous workplaces in the province of Ontario these days, and therefore... I mean, in my humble judgment, you ought to be pretty bloody high up the list of people who get their vaccines. How many of you have had your shots so far? Hands up. One, two. Only half of you. Okay. Janet, tell me about it. When did you get your shot and how was it? Um, I was very fortunate to be vaccinated as part of um, uh, leftover doses from our uh, orange helicopter uh, base. Uh, in January. Uh, so I was a very small group that got vaccinated uh, with the idea that we're vaccinating the vaccinators because of my position. Um, it was it was a very emotional time. Um, I became very emotional because it was like the beginning of the end. It's been such a hard year and uh, and it was kind of like hope. Uh, this this is what might bring this um, pandemic, to the end, or it might, it's the silver lining of um, a really, really difficult time. So uh, I've had both doses of my vaccine um, and we've vaccinated, um, we got, we weren't expected to get vaccine for our hospital staff um, until sometime next week. But we, because of our surge of cases, we received, um, uh, doses about three weeks ago, and we're able to vaccinate 115 people in uh, two vaccination clinics over two days. So um, it that was, it, and a lot of nurses were were very emotional during that time as well. A lot of healthcare workers, uh, physicians, uh, anybody in doing aerosol generating medical procedures, we. Um, we prioritized them with, under the provincial guidance, and uh, it was uh, it was very exciting. Well, congratulations. Okay, Vicki, how about you? What's your story? Yeah, it was a very emotional time. Um, feeling very grateful and blessed to have received both vaccines at this point. Um, a lot of my colleagues and myself, we work with COVID patients who are on mechanical ventilation, working in the ICU. So that was something that had to be a priority for us. Um, it does feel like it's the beginning to the end, right? It, there's some hope, there's some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, like I said, very grateful to have received the vaccine at this point, and I'm really excited for the rest of the public to start getting it as well, so we can get back to something that resembles normalcy. Patricia, how is it possible that you go into prisons and you have not been vaccinated yet? 
Um, well, that's it's all about a criteria through uh, public health. Uh, but one thing I'm really excited about is this afternoon I'm actually getting my first dose. So I have an appointment, and it's exciting because we're gonna. It's a full circle moment for me. My one of my graduates is involved in the vaccine clinic at Loyalist College, and she is going to give me my vaccine, or at least I'm hoping she's giving my vaccine as well. Last week and this week my students are finally getting the vaccine and they've been in the hospital. I'm actually more interested in them getting the vaccine than myself. Hmm. Amy, how come you haven't had yours yet? Well, well, I'm on the list. So I'm, I'm, I'm awaiting my turn. Um, again, like, like our colleagues have said, there is a, there is a system in terms of who receives it at, at the, at any time. And I am, I'm waiting, I'm on the list and I, I can't wait till I can get mine because I, I can't wait till I have the opportunity to maybe when things, when the lockdown settles down a little bit, then maybe I can actually hug my mom. I haven't seen her in almost eight months. Ah. Uh, okay, Vicki, here's the key question, and I need you to be absolutely 110% honest with me on this, okay? Does the needle hurt? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, your arm will be sore. Your arm will definitely be sore for the next couple of days after the vaccine. <laughs> uh, okay, because uh, I don't have to tell you, there's a lot of people watching this right now who are chicken to get a needle for, for understandable reasons. And um, COVID or no COVID, they may want to know that um, that's not going to hurt for too long, right? Is that the it's message? A short, it's a short, short pain, but for a long-term gain. There you go. Okay, that sounds good. That sounds good. <laughs> Um, we do have just a couple of minutes left here. Janet, I wonder if you would tell us um, what changes do you think are still possible at this stage of the game that could make all of the things we've talked about over the last half hour better? Oh, there are so many things. Um, I think one of the big things, and, uh, and it, that's been really evident uh, right from the beginning of the pe pandemic is procurement of PPE and how we rely on other countries to supply us with with PPE and and that's what feeds our supply chain and I think that was definitely one of the fears um, of many hospital staff uh, in the early early um, days of the pandemic was um, do we have enough PPE? We're going a best. Uh, we're going against best practices by uh, extending the use of our PPE, and where normally we would change it much more often, and uh, because we just don't have the supply. And so I think um, one of the big things for me would be uh, Canada having more of a, a take on um, manufacturing PPE in in Canada. That is a, an extremely important thing to put on the record, and I hope the appropriate authorities are listening. Janet, Patricia, Amy, Vicky, it is really great of all four of you to join us on TVO tonight. Uh, we wish you absolute good fortune and good health as you continue to do the job that uh, you are so well trained to do and that we need you to do so well these days. Be well, everybody. Thank you. You be well, Thank too. Thank you.